Hello, and welcome back to the Manufacturing Culture Podcast, the ultimate hub for insights and inspiration in the world of manufacturing. I'm your host, Jim Mayer, absolutely pumped up to bring you another episode that's sure to spark ideas and passion. Before we get rolling, a quick reminder to check out our website at manufacturingculturepodcast.com for more fantastic episodes and stories. And for the latest updates and engaging discussions, follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. A big shout out to our sponsor, Spironi, the trailblazers in manufacturing and innovation. Their dedication to advancing the manufacturing industry with cutting edge technology and solutions is absolutely astounding, making them an invaluable ally to businesses aiming for the top. Now, Let's welcome our extraordinary guests, a trio of industry behemoths with a mind-blowing 100 years of combined experience in manufacturing. We're kicking off with David Bovis. With 37 years of industry and advisory experience, David has been a pivotal figure in shaping manufacturing culture and strategy. His journey spans from hands-on roles in the shop on the shop floor to influential positions in the boardroom across the UK and Europe. David's academic achievements, including a master's in applied neuroscience from ION, have armed him with unique insights into the human aspects of manufacturing. He's the brains behind the BTFA model, an innovative framework that merges neuroscience with pragmatic solutions. This model has revolutionized the approach to lean digital strategies, and cultural change in manufacturing. It aligns with the principles of TPS and Dr. Deming's SOPK, particularly in psychology and theory of knowledge. David, you're going to have to correct me later on what that is because that's beyond my, my body of knowledge. David, in collaboration with Levent Turk, has also spearheaded an online education program that disseminates a BTFA model to global change leaders and C-suite executives. This initiative has been instrumental in enhancing leadership and project success in organizations like GKN Aerospace, where David's influence is profoundly felt. Next, we have Levent Turk, a giant in the industry with 37 years of experience. His career at Toyota, spanning 16 years, includes roles such as general manager of production and quality, engineering and purchasing director, and president of Toyota TME Turkey. Levent's deep understanding and implementation of the Toyota production system in Japan and across European Toyota plants have been pivotal in his career. Post-Toyota, Levent has played critical roles in managing lean transformations at leading automotive OEMs, including CarSan and Man, Truck, and Bus. His expertise in lean transformations is highly sought after, and his impact on the industry has been substantial. Rounding out our panel is Edwin Vandenberg, a visionary with 26 years of rich and varied experiences, experience in operations and lean methodology. Starting his career as Chief Design Engineer at Royal Phillips Electronics, Edwin's path has been one of constant evolution and innovation. His involvement in design engineering laid the foundation for a career marked by growth, learning, and leadership. As a production group leader, he dove into lean methodology, becoming a Six Sigma black belt and later a master black belt. His roles at Philips Consumer Lifestyle Business, particularly in engaging global teams in lean thinking and continuous improvement, highlight his commitment to driving change and excellence. As VP of Head of the Lean Academy at GKN Aerospace, Edwin's role in implementing the BTFA-based Psychology of Change Leadership Program showcases his leadership in shaping future manufacturing leaders. His efforts have led to significant breakthroughs in lean deployment and continuous improvement certification curriculum. Together, David, Levent, and Edwin are the embodiment of innovation, leadership, and transformation in manufacturing. Their individual journeys and collective wisdom have reshaped the manufacturing landscape, inspiring countless professionals and organizations to rethink what is possible in leadership and culture. 
So listeners, strap in for an episode that's not just a conversation, but a masterclass with the best in the business. Prepare to be awed, informed, and inspired. David, Levent, and Edwin, welcome to the Manufacturing Culture Podcast. You three, this is an absolute titan moment for me uh, because not only do we have so much experience in the room, I've got three different countries represented on the screen next to me here. So thank you guys very much. It was uh, uh, an absolute exercise trying to get all of our schedules aligned, but this is perfect. Thank you guys for being on today. No, thanks for having us, Jim. It's great to be here. Great to be here, Jim. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank for you. Us. Thank you. Yeah, Levent, you're very welcome, my friend. Um, our listeners will come to learn that Levent may not say a lot of words, but what he does say is profound. So, Levent, I'm excited to hear from you today. Uh, let's go down the line. I'm just going to go straight by what I see on the screen here. Levent, tell us about your journey. How did you get uh, from where you were to where you are today? Okay. <clears throat> um I, uh, as, as you mentioned, uh, I worked for Toyota for 16 years, uh, including Toyota Japan. So uh, at the end of 16 years, um, I was thinking that I was an expert of Toyota production system, lean and operational excellence. And with that confidence, I left Toyota and joined to another automotive OEM. Um, that was a big shock for me. Uh, I think that was the time I understand the importance of people and culture. So uh, mm. that was a lesson to learn that it's not about tools, methodologies, and systems that bring the success, but it's the support of people. If people don't support you, <clears throat> you cannot be successful. You can push them and be successful, but that will not be sustainable. In any case, <clears throat> culture is uh, as important as the tools and systems we use. So um, a question came to my mind, which is, can we develop a, a high performance culture like Toyota's culture outside of Japan? Yeah. And um, it has been 20 years and that question is still in my mind. In the meantime, I read a lot about uh, philosophy, psychology and neuroscience to find the right answer while I was working in Lean and OPEX business. Um, I had chance to <clears throat> implement and learn from the consequences of my implementations. I have written a book even about um, Toyota principle respect and its role on operational excellence. Um, but I recently realized that the answers, clear and objective answers to the questions we are looking for is available in neuroscience. You know, uh, recent technical advancements in technology helped us uh, understand what's happening in the brain much better. Um, about four years ago, I met David, <clears throat> and our approaches overlapped, matched each other. So we decided to develop this BTFA online leadership course. Uh, this is my story. Wonderful. Now, I think we have an answer to that question. If uh, people can understand how brains work, they can engage with each other much better. They can understand why people behave the way they do. If leaders understand this, mm -hmm. they don't have to be afraid of those behaviors because according to BTFA model, behaviors are not random. They follow a cause and effect relationship. So if we understand this relationship, we can handle behaviors which will help leaders a lot. This is my story. Thank you. I like it. I like it, Levent. Well done. Thank you. Edwin, you're next up here. Um, let, let's let's hear your story. Well, in your introduction, Jim, you already mentioned that I started out as a de chief design engineer in Royal Phillips Electronics. Yeah. And with that, you need to know that there's two things about me that, that make my life extremely difficult. First of all, I can't sit still. I really can't. And when you're a chief design engineer, you're expected to sit behind your desk and do 3D modeling and designing all day long, yeah. which I was really happy to be doing, but it also started nagging me. I, the second thing about me is that I, my top Gallup strength, when you do that assessment of that fantastic company, is to be a learner. 
So I always want to do new things. And that basically meant that next to my design uh, efforts and, and the things that I was putting on the screen, I always walked around, tried to find out where I could have that next challenge, that next thing that I could learn. Um, so it wasn't for all that long. I spent about two, two and a half years and in my first job designing uh, machines and equipment in X-ray um, when I got an opportunity to move to the United States. Royal Phillips had uh, bought a small startup company uh, in metrology where there was a, a very brilliant idea, but there was the first machine still needed to be sold and actually still needed to be built. So it wow. was fantastic. There was loads of things to learn. There was loads of things to design, but there was also a fantastic need to do and build and be in operations. We, uh, in two years, we grew, grew that startup company from 22 people and, and zero revenue to uh, uh, double the size in people, but more importantly, a 25 million revenue company. It was fantastic time. And it was my first introduction to operations. And since then, I've never left. I have an academic background. Design engineering is very much a scientific driven process. But in the United States, I was introduced to that, that hands-on experience, the hacksawing <laughs> of things that don't fit whilst in the computer, they're fantastic. All that, all that stuff really spoke to me. And the other thing is I was introduced to, as a team, just needing to deliver, just building that product that you've just sold, but it still actually needed to be created. Yeah. Anyways, that, that was a fantastic start and a, 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 a great beginning of a, a journey that brought me across the world. I returned to the Netherlands after a couple of years to that same company, led as a group leader the building of X-ray machinery. Later on, I did bulk production of fluorescent tubes. And in all that time, uh, when you talk about culture, when you talk about continuous improvement and change management, every single time, I learned the hard way. Very often, I fell flat on my nose. I had struggles with people that I tried to, to move from one direction to another to change the way they behaved. And all that time, there is that human element. And yeah. as a human being, you're trying to find those knobs to turn to, to, to really engage, to, to really tell people, show people what it is that is going to be in it for them. And back then, I was really... Uh, logically driven. We talked about PDCA in our introduction, um, and that's a logical approach. If you do this, then the outcome will be that, and that will be better for you. Right. It took, took years, but I was uh, allowed a fantastic opportunity in that same company um, to drive uh, an event called the Continuous Improvement Competition. It went by various names, the Business Improvement Competition, the Business Excellence Competition. Many teams that did improvement projects were competing around the big World Cup of being the best improvement team. And I was able to join them and feel the excitement and feel the emotion and feel what made their day, what drive, drives their energy and how that really turns back into revenue for the company, yeah. as well as a fantastic workplace for these people to work in. Yeah. During all that time, I was also introduced to Lean. Lean is a, a, a very well-known uh, logical approach very often to improvement. Mm -hmm. But Lean also talks about culture. Lean also talks about leadership and servant leadership and change your style and approach. And in my 26 years of experience, about 21 of them have been around how do you really make change happen? And there's many models. We know the Cotter change model, which tells you how. We know the Simon Sinek golden circle, which tells you why. And nowadays we know BTFA, which tells you it's about you. It's about people. It's about brains. It's about emotion. It is really giving you the handles to, um, to make things happen as a team, as a group of people. Driving culture that way is fantastic to do. And... I moved to GK and Aerospace about five years ago with the assignment of helping to build that lean operating model that we've experienced as a collective team of over 30 people in different companies into something that really matched what GK and Aerospace needed. And with that move, we, I was also introduced to David Bovis in our first lean leadership training. And during that lean leadership training, the very first thing I remember, David, is when you spoke about people being stuck on a hamster wheel. 
<laughs> people being put in some sort of situation, some sort of environment that really drives the way they behave. And it opened my eyes. I thought, wow, this makes a lot of sense. And I started having that conversation around how does BTFA, the Believe, Think, Feel Act, coincide with PDCA, the Plan, Do, Check Act? Well, how yeah. does it get together? How do you make those things not only logical, but also emotionally fit into that journey of improvement? It's been a fantastic journey, Jim. I am thrilled and honored to be on this podcast. I am also thrilled and honored to be leading the Lean Academy in GK and Aerospace. And uh, with all this scientific background, I secretly every now and then tell people, I bring the science, the rocket science. <laughs> David, uh, you're up. What's your journey been in the industry? Hello, uh, mate. Um, yeah, so, wow, where did I start? I mean, I, I started off, I didn't want to be an engineer, Jim. I wanted to be a, an actor or an artist. Um, and because it was early 1980s and uh, I was a working class family, I was told to stop being silly and go and get a proper job so I could pay some rent. So, <laughs> so I, uh, I did. I got into engineering uh, with some help from a brother-in-law who got me into an apprenticeship. But I was bored to tears. You know, I talk about wanting to always do something different. That That's me all over. Um, so eventually I managed to get myself into uh, uh, a plastic injection mold tool making apprenticeship, which at least was a bit better than the original precision engineering apprenticeship. It was good because it was medical. So it was really high precision. We were talking in radians rather than degrees. Um, and, you know, it, it it was interesting, but I realized very quickly through exposure there that I wasn't really cut out for the logical way of looking at life because i was i was given a task um, i think in about a third or fourth year of my apprenticeship to completely revamp and get working a broken uh 24 station capping and testing machine for the asthma inhalers that we were making um, and the whole thing it didn't have a plc in sight uh, it was just logic pneumatics. So it was all and or and nor gate type logic pneumatics. And the, the, the whole thing worked like that. Um, and I pulled my hair out, as you can see, for about three <laughs> months. Never did come back. But um, so anyway, I, that was the early 90s by then. Um, and I got made redundant. So because of different things that were going on in the UK economy, ended up in Germany working on press tools for Porsche and then came back to a production engineering role. And that production engineering role saw me, um, as I was told at the time, go to get brainwashed by the Japanese. Um, so I was put on a training course up in Leeds um, and introduced to what was then called world-class manufacturing, right, which ultimately became lean. Um, and I was fascinated because my dad was ex-army. So all of that common sense approach to doing things. And within the first 15 minutes of the introduction, I was like, oh, I like this, you know, it's not brainwashing by the Japanese at all. And I wrote down every single thing that trainer said, because I thought he was telling jokes, he was making people laugh. And I thought, I want to be him, you know, I want to be the guy at the front of the room. Yeah. Um, if I'm going to do that, I need to learn it all backwards and forwards. So I did. It was for a passion to be center of attention <laughs> that drove me to learn lean as deeply as I could. Um, and then, of course, when I moved jobs and got into a procurement role to introduce Kanban um, across a £20 million pound manufacturing SME, um, I ended up leading the way on some of that stuff uh, and um, really engaging with it. But what I did see in the first couple of roles after that was the people in the businesses that I worked in really knew what they were talking about knew the business backwards and forwards they knew the market they knew the equipment they knew the software they knew how it all worked the personalities of the leaders how you could approach different people and then consultants would come in and they would blast through those people as if they didn't matter they wouldn't listen to them and they wouldn't take anything on board about their knowledge they this you know their tacit intuitive wisdom mm -hmm. um, and I thought, well, what's, what's going on? I was probably mid to late 20s, 25, 26 by this time. And I I'm, I'm kind of took a step back and thought, you've got a group of people that really know what they're talking about in terms of the business. And you've got a group of people that really know what they're talking about in terms of how you make businesses better. And they're just not getting along. They're not, they're not coming together. Um, yeah. and, I thought, you know, and it was almost like two sets of beliefs. So I asked the question, which has haunted me forevermore, what makes somebody believe what they do? Um, and then I thought, well, the first thing to think about beliefs is theology, right? So I went and studied theology, which led me to 
philosophy, and I didn't find any answers in either of those. Um, <laughs> despite looking at two thousand years of philosophy from Aristotle to Kant, Hume, Descartes, and Nietzsche, you know, and then. I got into psychology because of that. And then, and this is over the 30, 25, 30 year period. Um, and then neuroscience started coming around alongside psychology in the late nineties for me. Mm -hmm. um, by 2009, neuroscience went through a bit of a revolution and got a lot more funding. Um, and it was 17, 18 years ago that having studied the psychology and the neuroscience side by side, I come up with the BTFA model um, to try and make it simple and explain what I was enjoying learning to other people. Um, but I got it really, really wrong. You know, I used all the wrong language. I started talking about dopaminergic mesolimbic pathways and just losing people. And they were looking at me as if I was mad. So I, I thought, well, this isn't working. You know, I want to pass on what I'm learning and why it makes so much sense. But it's got to be very simple um, yeah. to start with. And that's why BTFA has become so popular and, and, and so powerful. Um, but yeah, but wind the clock forward from all of that. And, you know, like Levent said, we met in late 2018, I think, um, spent ages on, on LinkedIn calls and, you know, or, or <laughs> Skype calls back then, I think it was still, um, you know, and, uh, and then eventually decided that we were so well aligned that we had to do something together. And, and my biggest problem is my brain is that all over the place, piecing the whole universe together, trying to bring it together in something that's deliverable was always my greatest challenge. Um, and Levent has got this phenomenal brain that was able to do that. So between us, we've just been able to deliver this product and not knowing how it was going to go. We, we put it into the market in its digital format. Obviously, when I met Edwin and the guys at GKN, we, we, I trained it to their team uh, in London face to face over two days or in Birmingham. I think we went to London first, didn't we? And then Birmingham afterwards. Um, but we wanted it to be scalable. We needed it to be something that was consistent, you know. Um, and knowing how fickle I am and how I go all over the place with different stories all the time, we really needed to make it consistent. Um, and and we done that, put it into the market um, late 22, I think it was. And, oh, my goodness, the, the, the success of the approach has just been surprising and, and really lovely because it, I did, we didn't expect it to be quite as, as effective as it is. Um, yeah. And we've got, you know, a number of clients, but obviously, you know, GKN, early adopters uh, at the hands of Edwin and Philip and their team. Um, and it's just been, yeah, great. Really, really fantastic. So I'm really enjoying life for the first time ever because I didn't ever want to be an engineer, like I said. <laughs> so this this, um, this side of it is just great. And helping people is what it's all about, really. You get that bit right yeah. and everything seems to fall into place. Awesome. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, and rest of the panel. Uh, <clears throat> Levent and David, uh, BTFA stands for Believe, Think, Feel, Act. Tell me a little bit more, tell us, uh, explain the model for us. Um, and and what, is, what is it going to do to help transform the, the culture in, in the manufacturing industry? Okay, okay. Should I go? I'll go, Levent. Um, <clears throat> So what's it going to do? Let's start at the end and work backwards. Um, if you take the sort of the, the business, a very common business mantra, people, process, systems, and or technology, right, which comes from management world, which is great because we do need to cover those three things. When you think about it, we've got all the language we need around systems, all the IT, the AI, the machine learning, and everything all the way back to old MRP days um, and everything in between. We've got, from a process point of view, pretty much all the knowledge we could ever need in terms of flow and Six Sigma analysis, you know, ANOVA and all that kind of um, stuff that goes on with that. When you come to asking how do people work, we've got no answers. You know, the, the, the people piece is really shallow in terms of what we know. So what BTFA does is it brings the knowledge in leaders around the people piece up to the same level as the knowledge we've got around process and systems and technology. Um, and that's why it needs the science to back it up because we can't afford to rely on, um, let's say, observational science uh, and subjective language that we get from, you know, human-centered disciplines. Uh, the neuroscience comes along and it just makes everything crystal clear because it's like Levent said earlier, it's about there's a cause and effect relationship. If the brain receives sensory stimulus in one format, the brain's evolved to defend us and keep us safe based on how much glucose energy it consumes. It will respond in a certain way to a certain threat. And the way it's evolved, 
you know, impose control, impose KPIs, all these things that we take for granted in business, funnily enough, get interpreted as a threat by the human brain. So we create environments in which human beings are fundamentally shut down from the start just because of the standards we expect um, to, sure. to control organizations by. So what it's going to do is, is it's going to fill the gap that's been missing. You know, it's, it's the logic emotion on a sort of polarized point of view. But if you look at that triangle of people process systems, it's filling that, that third piece of the puzzle that we just haven't had. And we haven't been able to have until neuroscience came along. Um, we've only really had the key aspects of neuroscience proven um, so that experiments can be repeated. And we've got, you know, double blind kind of experimentation that sits behind it. Um, since, you know, from the mid 2000s, 2009 was a big turning point um, when a lady called Elizabeth Gould uh, at Princeton, uh, you know, once and for all proved this principle of neurogenesis, which is the birth of new neurons in brains in humans, in, in adult human brains. So that, that's, that's what it will do. It will fill that gap. Um, what it is, Jim, is um an acronym that runs in both dots it's not even an acronym it's an initial an initial i can't say an initialization <laughs> of belief think feel act as you've said but it runs in both directions so it just very simply to expand on it a little bit if we think that we talk belief right now that's probably the worst word in the model because people jump to conclusions about what the word belief means mm -hmm. actually what we mean by belief is that you because of the way the brain forms and reacts to the environment, inbound sensory stimulus, you know, th things that happen in the outside world get in, come into your brain through your senses and get processed. And that exercise triggers the birth of neurons. So your brain grows, right, from when you're born until you're adult. And it doesn't stay like that. It changes all the time, this process of neurogenesis. So what we're left with is a wiring pattern, if you like, a, um, a, a set of neurobiological wiring in our brain. Now, how that's formed by experience is what we believe good and bad looks like, right? What's good, bad, right or wrong is a belief. And it's all represented by this wiring pattern. But it, it doesn't do anything on its own. It's just a biological mass if it sits there like that. So there has to be something going on in that wiring. And mm -hmm. the electrical signals that we power with the carbohydrates converted to glucose energy from our food is the firing of that wiring, right? So belief is the wiring, thinking is the firing. And we don't only have an electrical component to that firing process. There's the chemical component uh, because we have to get the electrical signals to trigger the release of chemicals across synaptic gaps. Okay. That mix of chemicals is how we feel. That, that shift in chemical in our, and, and hormones, neurotransmitters, in our brain and our body, which are all connected, is how we feel. That's why we have a gut reaction to something, you know, or it's heartfelt, because there's mm -hmm. neurons connecting our gut and our heart to our brain. So we've got this believe, think, feel, act. So it's wiring, firing, chemicals, and those precede how a human being will respond and react in any given situation or environment. But because wow. we have a, a you know, we, out, we put, output that signal, and that triggers a response in other people, it comes back the other way around. So how we act and interact with the world triggers that emotional response as part of our defense mechanisms, which triggers that firing patterns in our brain. And that process between firing and um, feeling triggers this neurogenesis process. So we adapt and respond to our environment to survive it and continue to be able to survive it. So that's, that's BTFA in a nutshell. That's kind of how it works and um and the more we know about that, which is what we teach in the course, on the online course, is it, it just transforms the way people see themselves. And, and we get a lot of very positive feedback about improved relationships at a personal level, not just yeah. in the work at home as well. Um, so, yeah, the science really, we we we're kind of reinforcing a lot of the wisdom that comes from philosophy and theology. We are verifying the... Uh, assumptions that have been made from an observational psychological perspective and we're doing it with science uh, and uh -huh. it's the science for the logical western thinking scientific brain that makes right. all the difference because now they can believe in why it works so i don't know what you'd add to that levin would you yes <clears throat> um um we are uh, coming from an engineering background whether we love it or not so uh, we are not professional trainers. <laughs> we are coming from in industry. 
and uh, we know how things go. What are the difficulties leaders are having and managers are having? Mm-hmm. So we know that managers should deliver results. Training is good. In- improving motivation through training is good, but will it help them to improve results? Is is the big question. Um, personally, I have attended a lot of trainings, and I left those trainings with some points that I picked up. I promised myself that I will change my behaviors. I will be that kind of a guy, but it did, it didn't work. Uh, so we know that managers have to deliver results, and they are under pressure. But to deliver results, people should support you. Um, you should be able to manage the environment so that their performance will be much better. So. A manager needs to understand human behavior, why people behave the way they do. Mm-hmm. If they are continuously defending th- themselves, why are they defending themselves? So what they can do is mm-hmm. to learn management theories, motivation theories. You have, you, you know, there are tens of such theories, and they have to learn recent theories like personality traits, mindset, emotional intelligence. Uh, on top of that, to understand those concepts and theories better. They need a um, certain level of psychology background and understanding. So even if you give all this information to all your managers, the possibility that, that they will make the same synthesis in their minds is impossible. I mean, there, it is zero. Mm-hmm. I never saw two managers who have the same approach to management. This is the problem. We can learn Lean, OPEX, Six Sigma, etc., and we can implement them exactly the same way. But when it comes to people and behavior, we all have different ideas and we are pulling in different directions. Yeah. And if in these conditions, manager, it's natural that managers will feel helpless. So if they cannot understand and handle behaviors, they may easily tend to control behaviors because they have to deliver mm. results. I think this is what's going mm. on. We cannot blame managers and, or accuse them. I am sure 95% of them are doing their best. Uh, but how to help them is something uh, that veterans do, like us. So we developed mm-hmm. BTFA for that purpose. BTFA, <clears throat> um, before coming to BTFA, which David mentioned, if we don't provide uh, our managers such tools to understand and manage behaviors, and if they tend to control behavior, what happens is obvious. According to Gallup's latest research last year, 2023, the disengagement is 77% worldwide. If 77% of employees are disengaged, what are we talking about? They will not care or embrace change. They will not support their leaders. And the initiatives of leaders will not be sustainable. It's clear. So we have to find a solution mm-hmm. to this disengagement problems. So if people are disengaged, they will not try to align in between each other and pull in the same direction either. So we, uh, we um, created BTFA online course as a simplest, simplistic tool, but neuroscience-based tool that managers and leaders can use to understand, analyze human behaviors and help them to change. This would have been my, my side. Thank you. Yeah, Edwin, can, uh, for those people who may, for some reason, not be familiar with who GKN is, can you tell us just briefly about the organization? Who are you guys and, and how many employees do you have, etc.? Yeah, a real brief summary. GKN Aerospace is the number one tier, one supplier in the aerospace industry. We make aircraft parts. We make engines, we make landing gear, things like that. Uh, we make aero structures, and we do so in the civil airframe uh, area, and we do so in the defense area. Um, with that, um, we are known for in- innovation. We are known for the scientific approach to making those parts world class, and we try to be the most trusted and sustainable partner in the sky as well. So our future investments obviously are all around um, net zero by 2050 or sooner. Um, We've got 15,000 people across the globe working for us and working for you. 
And we pride ourselves. We are in about 99% of all commercial aircraft that fly out there. So if you've been flying, you've been using our products. And that makes us realize how important the things that we do are for you and your lives, your loved ones, because whatever happens, we need to make sure that it's not us that fail so that you come home to your families safe and sound. Zero mission failures. That's the idea. Absolutely. Yeah. I love it. Um, thank you. Uh, so this, this question is for any of you three or all of you three, however you want to answer. In your minds, and this is really going to tee up the rest of the conversation here, guys. In your minds, what is the role of leadership in shaping and forming company culture, especially in the manufacturing industry? I'm only hanging back because I speak too much. But <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> I think we're all uh, at the tip of our chairs to say the same thing. <laughs> leadership is vital to culture. Leadership shapes, builds, and actually lives culture by example. Um, and it's very interesting to see the culture differ, not just per country, not just per site, but even for each individual team that is led by a leader. And I, I live that every day. I was just talking to David and Levent. I went into a site yesterday and I spoke with three different uh, group leaders of three different areas. And what you find is the culture in those areas differs tremendously. And having the tools of BTFA and being able to speak the language of BTFA makes a huge difference to the success of each of these teams. And that is through the fact that um, the way that we act, the, the things that we do, if they're driven within the right culture, uh, you're going to aim for success. You're going to be a team that works towards that success and you're going to get there. You're going to have the energy and the longevity to see it through. Whereas if your leadership is a controlling style, a classical leadership of telling you what you need to do instead mm -hmm. of building upon the team and everybody's individual contribution in that team, and if you have mm -hmm. that plastic leadership style, you have every reason to believe and see those teams fail. The easiest example that I very often use is to talk about personal protective equipment. You have these plants and these sites that you visit, you walk through the gate, and you immediately feel that safety is important. You see everybody wearing their high-vis vests. Everybody will make you aware of where the traffic is coming from, and everybody will tell you if something's wrong. You also have the opposite. And I pride myself in the fact that we always put safety first within GK and Aerospace, and we've, we've learned the hard way, unfortunately. Um, but it is true that there are sites, there are companies that you walk through the gate, and you immediately change your own behavior. Mm -hmm. um, you, you immediately feel that, hey, it, it's okay to just walk on the street here. It's okay to, to not really look or maybe use your phone whilst you're in traffic. <laughs> um, those things are dangerous yeah. and they won't be uh, success factors. They, they will have that risk of not returning you home safe to your family. Um, yeah. it is a, it's the leadership that makes or breaks the culture. It's the leadership that we need to talk to first when it comes to, hey, it's not just logic. And it's definitely dangerous to do everything with rules. It needs to be the combination. Yeah. David Levent, anything to add to that? Well, I can't really add it's much. It. I, could, I can put it the same message in my own words differently. Levent, over to you, mate. Go, go on. I think it's a very good definition. And <laughs> um, it, it's also about awareness um, that mm. not only leaders, but all of the employees have a role, uh, have an influence on culture with everything that they mm -hmm. do and they don't. Sometimes we have to do something, but we don't. We refrain to do it. It has also an effect on culture. Mm -hmm. I think it's all about this awareness and leaders can help a lot to develop this awareness. As uh, Edwin was saying, we are normally living in hamster wheels. You don't need to be conscious to survive in this world. We are programmed hardwired to do so. But leaders can help mm. people go out of the hamster wheel and think consciously what they are doing. Um, just a minute ago, Edwin was saying, perhaps we, we need to stop and think about our emotions. Perhaps we need to talk about our emotions. This may be the best way to engage with each other 
before we start QDCH, right? Edison? Absolutely true. And when you talk about leadership, we, we very often immediately talk about the hierarchical leadership within teams and within production or manufacturing sites. But think about all the informal leaders that you know. These are the people that drive really the culture as it is on Absolutely. a day-to-day -day basis. What I really love to do, and I do as often as I can, is join the night shift. Go in when everybody else has gone home and dress down. Make sure that you wear the same clothes as people. Make sure that you have that cup of coffee. The best change management tool is having a cup of coffee with people and leveling with them about who they are, about what makes their clock tick, about what is frustrating them. Not lying, not, not leaving away the truth. You can definitely tell who you are and why you're there. But the fact that you're taking the time to go out of your regular routine and be one of them, be interested in what makes people feel good and mm -hmm. what makes people feel the company should be doing better, it, it works absolutely best if you take the time to respond on the emotional level with, with people that are working there. And, and everybody that I know and have spoken to and with uh, in this way, they're all coming in to do a good job. They're all coming in to be enjoying their work. They all have personal lives that are important to them. And it is that we talk about work-life balance. It's one thing. It is work-life, work and life is one thing. And it will always be that way. So what happens at home, the emotional state that you come to work with will determine what it is that you can and cannot do at work. And okay. vice versa. You have a hard time if you're being controlled, if you're being, yeah, um, if you're being frustrated and you go back home your personal life is going to suffer as well. And that's yeah. obviously not what we want. What we want is to have people feel comfortable, feel comfortable, yeah. speak up, share their minds, and also come with suggestions on, hey, this is our common goal. This is what we believe we need to change into. It's not going to work this way. This makes me feel like, yeah, it's, it's not going to get us there. If we do it this way, it's going to work for me. It's going to work for that team, and it's going to actually change my working experience for the be better as well as to deliver that better output, that improvement, that change that we want to drive together. I love it. David, what do you have, Dad? Um, my, my brain's gone off in a slightly different direction, which is not unusual. <laughs> I mean, if we struggle to have a really good, robust definition of culture, don't we, to share between most people. But if we do, we get into it. Some people, you know, shine or talk about artifacts and surroundings and bits and pieces. But, you know, we, we inevitably it comes back down to values, beliefs, principles, the, the things that we believe. You know, how do we define what's good, bad, right or wrong in the world? You know, and as we said earlier, that's a wiring pattern in our brains. So if we've got... Um, and some kind of agreement around what culture is, which is you know how people are acting based on their beliefs about what good looks like, mm -hmm. then and how they act together because they share that belief, then mm -hmm. culture in some respects is about shared belief. How do we define a belief or a value or a principle? Well, you do it with words, right? And and as we show in the course, words have a, a an impact on the way the brain works because they feature all over in different neurons um, which trigger the release of those different chemicals so how people feel is really closely related to what words they use so if we're yeah. talking about leaders impact on culture then we have to think about the type of words and attitude and the beliefs that the leaders hold now if mm -hmm. they've got vastly different beliefs about what good looks like they will drive in different ways and that will become the culture in their environment so if we look at it like that then i mean we, we've got an alignment module that follows on from btfa after a couple of other steps and we we quite often say that if you just kind of do a little mental exercise and imagine that a very simple model of a business is sales operations and finance and then shop floor top floor and management squeezed in the middle you've then got mm -hmm. a nine box model right in that nine box model, depending on where you are hierarchically, your beliefs about what good looks like have different time horizons, right? The guys on the top floor are talking three, five, ten years, depending on whether they're talking to the VC or the investor or not. You know, the guys in the middle are talking end of year, three years. The guys on the shop floor might be talking next hour, you know? Mm. So if you've got different time pressures and different time horizons on, that's going to change the way your brain works. The language associated to that is going to be different. 
So on the hierarchical basis, based on responsibility over time, you've got different input to, to drive different cultural outcomes. So you get different hi- cultures in hierarchical layers, right? Uh, and we all see that because di- the director level culture is different from the shop floor type culture. If mm-hmm. you then look at the verticals and you look at sales, ops and finance, the language in each vertical is different in each silo. So salespeople talk, you know, um, about maximizing sales and, and whatever else it might be, visits per day. And, you know, if it's a call center time on the phone, all that kind of stuff. You know, the finance guys are focused with the purchasing team on credit or debt days and return on capital employed and EBITDA. Um, and the ops guys are, are thinking about machinery and capex spend, and so the, the language registers are fundamentally different. So if you think about that, you've got you end up with nine cultural pockets just on a very simple map of an organisation, wow. based on the language, the time, the responsibility, and all these things that make people believe in good having a different definition. I.e., yeah. good is a. I mean, going back to my days with Swift Detection. We we did a little black and white video as a communication exercise, and we showed the sales team with Harold Lloyd music over the back of it, like Charlie Chaplin type black and white movie, going, "Yeah, we've sold all these new products, fantastic!" And the ops guy is going, "You sold them in pink? Oh my goodness! Do you not realise that DOD approval takes three years? We can't do that, you know." So good for the sales team didn't look like good for the ops team. Um, you know, same thing when we reduced a £1.4 million inventory value in a different company. The finance team had kittens. You know, from an ops point of view, Kanban implementation was great. We turned off the MRP system. The finance team had nothing to value the business on with the bank because right. of the stock was on. You know, so what good looks like for different people? And that's what we've got to realize. And the more we realize that, the more we can do a much better job of having those discussions that, allow us to understand the other person's perspective and not just go through life on that hamster wheel thinking that our blinkered view of the world based on our limited you know level of imprint in our brain is right good and proper you know it's mm. not it's always subjective and it's always contextual and it always has to be considerate of other, other people involved and when we get to that point you start getting better relationships and that's when culture rises interesting interesting so on the topic of culture, Edwin, tell, tell us a little bit about your journey with BTFA. Um, you, you've implemented it there uh, at GKN. Where, were, where was the culture before BTFA and, and where is it now? What, is it, what has been the impact of BTFA at GKN? Yeah, we're in, we're in the midst of a drive of, uh, in uh, implementing BTFA and deploying it. And you can definitely tell the difference. It is uh, fantastic to see. So I was first introduced myself to BTFA when I joined the first Lean Leadership Training. Um, And when we talked about what really is servant leadership, what does it mean? How do you do it? Then that understanding of how the brain functions makes you think completely different, makes you ask different questions. Um, And when we came out of the Lean Leadership Training, we talked about where can we first start to use this? Where can, we, where can we, we really implement a difference? We've got a five-phased model approach towards lean. And in the first phase, it is all about um, changing the mindset of the leadership that needs to drive the change in the site. So we decided to build um, uh, an activity called living the lean operating model. And we built a big poster and we said, everybody knows PDCA. And we're going to explain you the PDCA of how to do lean. And it starts with um, problem solving your day-to-day KPIs. You need your daily management. And there's some problems that you're going to identify. And then there's the logical follow-up of planning activities to close the gap, uh, checking, and then acting if it's not closed yet. Mm -hmm. Now, who remembers great change like that? And there was leadership teams that said, yeah, we've done this before. And these are excellent examples. And then we asked. Does it always work that way? (laughs) And equal amounts of examples came back where it absolutely failed to work. About Mm. 50% of those changes, the logical changes were everybody. And it turns out it's the small changes that work and it's the bigger changes that fail. And we talked about why is that? And then we started to, to, in that same picture, that visual, we connected BTFA on the opposite end of that same visual. So ACT is the connecting point. But if you approach the ones, the, the change management programs that worked, 
with a reasoning around, hey, what did people believe? What did they feel and think when they were working this change? And how did that end up in a change that succeeded? As well as what happened when it didn't work. And all of a sudden, you see the lights go on. You feel the, the team change. And there's about half a day that people talk about nothing else than BTFA. And that's when you know that it starts to really bring that message home. Mm -hmm. and, and then basically what we did was we've got a, uh, about 40, 43 different activities in our lean operating model. And with each of those activities, we uh, introduced the element of BTFA as the, the, the poster, living the lean operating model, what does BTFA look like when you do a Kaizen event? What does BTFA look like when you do an A3 problem solving? And talking about that this way actually makes a huge difference. The best example we have is again a safety example. We have an activity called behavioral-based safety. We know rules don't work. We know that people find it really awkward if you tell them, hey, you're not wearing your safety glasses or your, sa your laces are untied, and it's a, it's a danger thing. But they feel that they're being treated like kids. What do you mean my laces aren't tight? And it's a, I know it's dangerous, but yeah. And there's immediate resistance, right? It's almost like a threat. You're not going to write me up for this, are you? Whereas if you talk about behavioral-based safety, you talk about a completely different thing. You have the discussion around, what does it do with you if I tell you your laces mm -hmm. are, are untied? If you were to think, well, what he means is he wants to keep me safe. Mm -hmm. Would you then not just say thank you and quickly tie your laces and, and the hazard is solved? And if you, if you take a look at changing the culture, it starts with understanding BTFA and it starts with very small things that people can practice every day. The change is huge. The difference is huge. The days after you've introduced BTFA, the days after you've put on the poster in the rooms, everybody talks about this new concept because somehow it clicks. Somehow people understand it. The interesting thing is PDSA, PDCA is very linear, very logical, and it seems to be more difficult to understand than BTFA where everything influences everything. Your thinking influences the way you feel. Your feeling influences everything that you believe because if you feel positive, you're open to believing. If you feel negative, you're going to close down. And that, and that influences acting. So, so tangibly doing something with BTFA is actually quite difficult, but launching the concept and using it all the time actually is quite easy. David, what, what did you see when, when you first walked in versus where, where GKN is now? Wow, that's a good question. I think what I saw was <clears throat> a global change leadership team that had been trained outside of Toyota predominantly the same way I had in the West that was very practical, pragmatic, incredibly good at what they did in that linear command and control type basis. The documents yeah. were properly numbered. The sequence of those documents was properly deployed. Everybody updated everything because they took full responsibility for doing it within the team, and they went and did the lean in the sites. Um, I think, you know, yeah, I... The mindset has shifted. There's no other way to put it, probably. The beliefs have changed about what good looks like, that the, how, what, how, what you do and how you do it with other people and not to other people to be much more effective is a belief that's fundamentally shifted in all of the senior leadership team in the Lean Academy and the, the deployment program. I would, I, I, Levin, I mean, Edwin, would you, would you agree? I think that's... I, that's what I think I see from the outside. Uh, you, you were nodding. I'm guessing I haven't said anything. Oh, absolutely. It's it's very recognizable. And I, I, I smirked a bit because you talk about all the numbering systems that we have and, and all the, the uh, updates that we do on a daily, on a, on a weekly basis. And secretly, it drives us nuts at the same time. But it's so <laughs> nice to be able to just deliver on commitment. Um, but then if you talk about how, what does it do when you work with people, it drives them nuts as well. Mm -hmm. And you get all these comments around it frustrates me that we have to do so much administration. And you can't get past that point, which means you can't do your lean deployment and your change that is, is good for everyone, also, also the people that you work with, mm -hmm. until you start to change their beliefs.
until you start to have that discussion about why would you do it? Mm. What, what is the good that is in it? And by the way, what happens if we don't do it? Mm. And sometimes you need to admit, simply don't do it. Right. I, and, I think that that becomes a bigger question a lot of times. What happens if we don't do that? Right. And, and I think that's part of the, the mindset shift that needs to occur out there is what happens if we don't? We mm. know what will happen. We hear what the experts say about, you know, retention of employees, about engagement of employees by improving company culture, deploying BTFA, things of that nature. But what happens with, if we don't? That needs to start being, I think, the question that a lot of manufacturers need to start asking themselves. And, and again, going back to your point, Edwin, you know, you said it's when their belief changes. Is their belief in whether we have to set a standard, adhere to that standard, set principles? And the event, you know, from a Toyota point of view, will I'm sure elaborate for us in a minute on principle based practice. You know, you practice based on your principles, you based on your beliefs about what good looks like. And one, and you, you used this, you said when you start to realize why. You know, when you get people to ask themselves the question, why are we doing this? Why is this necessary? If they believe that setting a standard that everybody agrees to abide by for the benefit of all others, when it becomes a community thing and not just an imposition on you as an individual and that belief shifts, then you do things together. You don't try and avoid doing things on your own. So, right. you know, and it, but I think from a Toyota point of view, setting standards and having that belief in having a standard that you develop together through inclusion out of respect for each other like even just 5s like putting a tool back you know i remember being in the tool room and my boss screaming at me you stupid little i won't say what he called me but you know really <laughs> spitting in my face angry and i was like i'm, I'm 18 years old i'm going to, what have i done what have i done he went there's a, a richard was six foot seven right so of course in a tool room his name was big dick right Big Dick has been looking for that 10 mil drill bit for the last 20 minutes, you stupid little, you know. Um, and and it, I went home in tears that day. The point mm. was, I had been disrespectful to every other tool maker in that tool room by not having the self-discipline to put that drill back so they could find it and knew where it was when they wanted it. That's, it's a, 5S is about respect, right? We didn't call it 5S in 1980s tool rooms, but it was the same thing. You know, and when you develop that approach to how you conduct yourself and exercise self-discipline for the benefit of others so you can all be efficient together and protect the job in the company that you all want to work for, it's a totally different mindset. And, and I think in the West, we don't think that way. And I've, I've heard from Levent over the brilliant four years I've been working with him so much from how that is just ingrained and embedded as an approach and an attitude and a, that, that community spirit out of respect within Toyota. And it's that that led to the development of the tools, not the other way around. Toyota weren't taught tools and then they developed a culture. They had a culture right. and with that culture, the tools developed. But like I say, Levent, Levent can talk to the, the standardization and belief in setting standards much better than I can. Absolutely. Go ahead, Levent. Uh, no, I agree. It was a good summary again. <laughs> Thank you. In fact, uh, <laughs> The way Toyota develops culture is so simple. Put five simple principles and everybody follows them. That's it. The problem with us in the Western world is uh, we think we know all these values. For example, respect. Everybody thinks they know what respect means, but uh, they act differently. So there is a problem there. But instead of achieving a consensus on respect which is not easy we can achieve an, a consensus on how our brains work because it follows the same principle mm -hmm. which is much easier to achieve consensus on. wow powerful um how does btfa uh approach or uh address i guess maybe is a better word for it uh the psychological aspects of of change management that that needs to happen within manufacturing. I mean, Edwin, you've seen it firsthand. David Levet, you you implement it. What how the psychological aspects of change management are massive, and not a lot of people think about it. But tell us a little bit more about that. Um, in fact, <clears throat> we developed BTFA uh, for um, solving problems like 
disengagement, misalignment, and resistance to change simply. That was the starting point. Mm-hmm. But it, at the mean, in the meantime, <clears throat> we learned a lot from GKN and especially from Edwin because uh, GKN uh, Academy is, uh, according to my experience, has a very advanced level in terms of their knowledge and implementation on the job training, I can say. So we received a lot yeah. of feedback from GKN, which <clears throat> helped us develop our product also. But in the meantime, uh, I witnessed how uh, Edwin and GKN Academy made this synthesis of psychology of change and how they can use BTFA. So they are much more advanced than us. Probably Edwin can explain us better. Well, that's a that's a fantastic compliment to get Levent, but we've learned it all from YouTube. So it's very interesting that you say that. When I when I take a look at the psychological effects of change, it's very much driven uh, driving emotion. Um, the emotional uh, element of change is uh, something that we don't necessarily always take time for, uh, but it's a key factor in success or failure of uh, of change. And there's a beautiful abbreviation that a colleague of mine, Adam Nicklin, uh, made of something that I that I say very often. He says it's RITMOAL. It stands for repetition is the mother of all learning. Um, and then it's followed up with, and failure is its father. If you do change management, you're going to fail. You're going to do something new and you need to test it out. And it's different for everyone. So you're going to fail. The psychological effect of trying to get somewhere and failing is huge. And when you don't take time to address that, when you don't have words to talk about it, when you don't have a framework that tells you it's okay, it's human, we're all human, we're all going to go through this change curve and this is how that actually works. And now we have words to talk about it. Now we have a framework that says emotions are chemicals in our brain. And we can choose which chemicals get emphasized. When you do an emotional journey and you feel down because you've failed, at the back end of the day, when you talk about it and you have that framework and you can then laugh about it, you're replacing that emotion with a very positive follow-up. And it frees you up. It, It gives you new energy and you'll try again. So when it comes to psychology, Everybody steps back and says, oh, science and, you know, we're manufacturing guys, right? Not for us. So we don't always uh, talk in the terms of psychology, but we do talk about emotions. We do talk about feelings. We do actually change the way we, we start up the day, change the way we close the day based on the psychological impact of what happened the day before. And what we know is going to come the day that we're going to do these changes. So there is a huge benefit to knowing, understanding BTFA to the level of how the brain works, that emotions are chemicals, that thought patterns are actually electrons firing in brain patterns that are built over neurons that actually translate into something useful in the practice. It is fantastic to be using it that way. And it is so simple, everybody gets it. Got it. What what challenges did you guys have implementing uh, BTFA at GKN? Were there any? <laughs> Absolutely. It's like any change. Why do we need it? Uh, we're too busy for this. And by the way, we have to deliver. And right now we've got a quality problem. So let's all focus on that. So it's the same challenge as with every change implementation. However, sure. um, we've got the new way of approaching this also opens up new perspective for the people that work in uh, their mm. regular day-to-day challenges. So by using it, you're, you're sharing that language, you're sharing that it's okay to talk about this, which gives people uh, a lot of oxygen to use, not only on making things new or improving things with a, a lean operating model, but also in their day-to-day challenges. Um, yeah. So yeah, it is it is a big challenge in itself. BTFA and bringing that model and talking about science and brains and and psychology is a big change with its own challenges. On the other hand, it also has the answers that many of the other challenges don't. Yeah. And that's the beauty of it. I, I like it. I like it. David Levent, what what kind of challenges did you experience uh, uh, from your standpoint? 
Yeah, l- largely what Edwin's just said, Jim, actually. I think, you know, it's not common to find a great term, as we heard earlier in a different conversation today, hairy arsed engineers talking about <laughs> psychology and brains, right? And that's, that's the world we come from and the world we live in. Um, and uh, I just... It's so difficult. I guess, do you know what? I'll, I'll give you an example, right? There's a challenge that you can throw down to say, tell, describe a color you've never seen. Mm. Right? So how, how do you do that? And the answer is I can't because I don't have the language to describe it. Right. And it, it's, that's the situation we're in right now. We've got 50, 100 years of industrial engineering leading to tools and techniques, learning to logical thinking based on education of maths and physics that, has made sure that you know eq and and different terms that have tried to break through that barrier don't succeed um Mm -hmm. and so we've got a language register that's brilliantly well versed to talk about engineering talk about management to talk about leadership in logical terms and we're saying guys there's a different way that you can talk about this that mm-hmm. completely transforms the way you see the world it shifts your beliefs it looks changes your outlook on life and it fills that gap that's been missing that has led to change programs failing to try and get people that speak it is I, I used to say you know it, it's like asking uh, a french person to speak spanish and explain something to somebody from nepal right you, you, you're not it's different languages so and then, of course, learning a new language, especially if it comes with all that science, puts people off. So yeah. you want to be able to say, actually, look, you don't have to become a neuroscientist. You don't have to become a psychologist. We did all the heavy lifting on that. We've studied this stuff for 20 years. You know, we've lived and breathed it. We've tested it. We've found out what works and what doesn't work. What we've done is we've filtered all the good stuff out, left all the, you know, got the wheat from the chaff taken all those best bits and now we've put it into a linear learning pattern that your brain's designed to respond positively to so you Mm -hmm. can learn all the best bits and actually once you've been through it and seen it and like edwin said it suddenly clicked it makes sense and people get oh my goodness this explains everything you know that's the kind of responses we get and then they're left with btfa because then btfa is that simple language register that allows them to speak about what they've learned they don't have to remember it all they just have to really know that the science is there to back it up. So they, because what we're trying to do with it is shift belief, change belief in what good looks like about what you have to do to get human brains to respond positively in business in general and especially in change programs. So sure. our, our challenge is just getting people to be interested enough, curious enough, engaged enough. And we can explain why neurologically, <laughs> but it doesn't make it any easier from a marketing point of view. So, yeah, sure. It sounds to me like uh, similar to how math is the common language worldwide, right? Math is the same regardless of whatever language you speak, um, wherever you're from, two plus two equals four, right? It, It seems to me like BTFA is that same commonality, that same language bridge for business, for culture. Am I capturing that well? Absolutely spot on, mate. It's exactly what, yeah, I would say as well. It's, you could have people that advocate for CBT or NLP in psychology. You can have people that advocate for Six Sigma or Lean in business process improvement. You can have people that advocate for ERP or machine learning and AI in technical terms. You can have all different opinions of what good looks like. But you can't get past the fact that a human brain has evolved to work like this. So regardless of whether you want to promote MRP or AI or Lean or Six Sigma or Agile or whatever, your brain's still going to work the same way. Uh-oh, so it isn't. gives you that capacity to actually get everybody on the same, you know, start from the, talking about change with facts from science that applies to everybody consistently. So, yeah, I think you've, you've nailed it there, actually. Um, Fantastic. I think it's, Levin, it's, do you have anything to add to that? Yes. Uh, I think it was a very good description using math. Uh, that reminds me the words of Galileo Galilei. He said the book of the universe is written in math's language, right? And right. Uh, this is what exactly we are saying in BTFA. Our brains are parts of the universe, and they are also written the, yeah. in the math language, which means cause and effect. 
which in fact is not so difficult to understand. So if you know BTFA's mechanism, you can also understand why people behave the way they do. I, I don't know if anybody's ever uh, compared things that I've said to Galileo, but I'll take it. Thank you, Levent. Um, <laughs> that, very kind of you. Um, as we wrap up, second to last question here, guys. Common question. Usually I ask my guest, what are three things that manufacturers can do to change their culture internally? I'm going to ask you guys each for one. That way we get our three, but you're each going to give one. All right, Levent, one thing that's changed the that, that you recommend that manufacturers implement to change their culture internally. Yeah, I think leaders uh, should uh, help their managers, should equip with them some tools to, uh, to maximize people's performance. And the key yeah. to that is to understand people's behaviors and provide an environment that those behaviors will evolve to some behaviors of high performance. And that tool, tool that uh, leaders can provide to their managers is BTFA. BTFA online course is designed for that. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Edwin, same question for, for you. Um, the, I, I'm going to say two things because I really love what Levent said. He said, there's that BTFA online course. It is a animation course. Don't be too big to watch a cartoon. It's very much fun to learn that way. So manufacturers, please do. The other thing I'm going to say is have more coffee with people and talk about it's okay to feel this way. Talk about emotions. Talk about, hey, I believe that you are able to do this. What can we do to help you believe that as well? And start speaking that BTFA language. It makes a huge difference. Take yep. your personnel seriously. I love it. David, last but not least, one thing that manufacturer, and I know it's hard for you to keep it to just one, but <laughs> one thing, my friend, that, that manufacturers can do to change their, their culture internally. I'm going to uh, rely on an old maxim that was scribed on the doors in the uh, Temple of Delphi, which is know thyself. The, the more we can understand ourselves, the better job we can do for ourselves and for others. And up until now, that's been a very, very confusing thing to do. And neuroscience just lifts the lid. So know thyself and do that by understanding more about your brain. David, I've known you now for a year, maybe a little bit longer, maybe a little less. I think that was the most concise answer you've given to any question I've asked you in the time that I've known you. That was <laughs> that was amazing. That could be the clip of the episode. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen, uh, as we wrap up this conversation, last question I ask every guest, regardless of their background, future, or history, what is one thing that I didn't ask you today that you want to share with the listeners of this podcast? Good one. Um, well, then we're going to start with you. Something that people David, you don't get to go first. Quite a standard, so I'm probably being quite boring with this answer, is recommend a book to read. Um, so, I mean, the one that kicked it all off for me, my interest in psychology to begin with more than anything else, seems to be like that pivotal point when I was in my mid-20s, was a book called I'm OK, You're OK. Um, and, it, and it describes transactional analysis about how we interact but with psychological language i now know a lot more with neuroscience but it was yeah it was definitely the thing that started me off on my journey i think really awesome. so, all right Levent, right, let's go to you yes uh, we talked a lot about ptfa you could ask me um, if i really believe the, believe in what i am doing and my answer would be yes we are really trying to create workplaces in which brains perform at their best that's amazing. Edwin, last but certainly not least, what's one thing we didn't ask you? Um, I think one thing that you, you didn't ask me that I would recommend everybody to do is allow yourself to choose your emotions. And how do you do that? How do you allow yourself to choose your emotions? 
and learning by the, the BTFA model, learning about how your brain actually works is going to make a huge difference. That's powerful stuff. And that's why I asked that question at the end, because all three of your answers are going to be quotes that I use for this episode. So thank you very much. Uh, and there you have it, folks. Another incredible episode of the Manufacturing Culture Podcast is in the books. What a journey we've been on today. We dove into the world of BTFA and its impressive impact at GKA and Aerospace. We've journeyed through the minds of our esteemed guests, David Bovis, Levent Turk, and Edwin Vandenberg. Thank you three very much for being on today. We unraveled the complex relationships between neuroscience and culture in the manufacturing sector, something I never thought that I would have on my show as, as an intersection is neuroscience and culture until I met David. Um, <clears throat> for more episodes packed with inspiration and groundbreaking insights, be sure to visit manufacturingculturepodcast.com. There you'll find a wealth of content that will fuel your enthusiasm for manufacturing excellence. I owe a massive thank you again to Speroni for their steadfast support and sponsorship. Their commitment to innovation and precision in tooling exemplifies the spirit of what we talk about here. Speroni is more than a brand. They are trailblazers. Now, a call to action for all of you fantastic listeners out there. If today's episode sparked new ideas and excitement, please, please, please share it with your friends, colleagues, grandma, family, whatever. Uh, it, it, whether they're in manufacturing or not, your support helps us reach a wider audience and spread more of this transformative changes that we are seeing in our industry. I'd also love for you to rate and review the show on whatever podcast platform you listen to this on or on YouTube. If you're watching right now, your, <clears throat> your input is invaluable in helping us deliver the content you love and it shapes the direction of the podcast, but most importantly, it uh, rockets us up the charts. So more people actually find the, the program. Thank you again for tuning in to the manufacturing culture podcast until next time. Keep innovating and leading in the world of manufacturing. Let's continue uh, the conversation. Have a great day and keep making things.